What up YouTube, TK here, and today we're talking about calculators. Now, as many of you know, I do a lot of chiptune stuff under the anti-lag banner, that's me, and I perform on stage with these talking calculators. But the problem is, I've kind of gotten to a bit of an end point where I can't really do much more with these anymore. I'm kind of done with it, I kind of want to amp things up. So instead, we're going to take a new calculator, like this J Burroughs unit, or indeed this Casio DF120FM and turn it into a MIDI controller so we can do whatever we want with these. We're gonna pull both of these apart, see what's what, and we're gonna use an ESP32 inside for MIDI and hopefully wireless MIDI. We'll get to that part later. First, we're gonna disassemble these and figure out which one is easiest to interface with all the buttons and switches. We're probably going to stick with just the buttons for phase one. I only have a limited amount of time for this project before I have to play on stage at reception four, which is gonna be absolutely huge. This one I think is gonna be easier in the sense that there's more room on it, more space to actually fit stuff into the case. This one looks cooler. Um, but really, I'm going to be looking at it more than most people, and the bigger one might actually be better on stage anyway. We'll pull them both apart, see which one's easiest to interface. That is our number one concern. So far, so good. Couple of Phillips screws, couple of Phillips screws. Ooh, this is nice. I love it. Love it. Very good. All right, Casio first. Oh, yeah, those switches feel really nice on the Casio. Just trying to figure out how to get this open. I feel like I'm gonna have to pop it, but I don't wanna break it, cause it was actually, it was like 40 bucks, which is a ridiculous fee. There's, there's like 30 cents of microchips in this thing, if that. I love snap together construction when it works, I hate it when it doesn't. Uh, basically, and my, my meaning of works and doesn't is whether or not I can put the thing back together again without breaking it. I gotta say, this thing's probably never supposed to actually be taken apart. Like, I don't even think it has, it has a battery. Um, which they never expect you to replace. They expect it to rely on the solar panel, I guess. Um, cool, let's have a look there. So I'm not in love with the snap together case just because if I'm putting my own stuff in, that could be a little bit hard to work with. Uh, I prefer something I can screw apart, just pop in and out, but we'll see. Um, as for all the buttons, so these look like all the screen elements here. The buttons may be a little bit more difficult to figure out. Let's have a look on the other side of the board. Oh, that's kind of pressed in. This very much snaps in. The PCB snaps into the case and you can see these little plastic rivets where there's like a little nub that comes through the PCB and then they flatten it over with heat to hold the PCB in place. Um, I don't love that just because, again, I want to be able to disassemble, reassemble this thing 50 times without it getting sloppy. But it's okay, that's why we bought multiple calculators so we can decide which one we want to use. I just want to get to the other side of this thing. Okay, so we're probably not using this calculator. God, that's annoying. That's really embarrassing. <laughs> I mean, I know those are there, but I sort of thought maybe I could just push through them. Well, let's see what we can salvage from this build. Okay, so we've lost three buttons already. <laughs> that's, that's shit. Okay, so with those clipped off. Okay. I'm trying to figure out where all those traces go. One thing I noticed right away is the complexity of the button pads. Look at those, like see those, see those patterns? That means that when your little rubber membrane, when this carbon pad actually hits that, there's so many little intersections for it to make contact. It means the buttons are gonna like trigger really reliably, which is something we probably want for musical performance. So I'm now even a little bit more upset that I've, I've messed up this, this example a little bit. So we can see here, uh, for example, we can see like a big long trace joining up a whole bunch of these button pads here. And we see a horizontal trace here uh, for the number buttons and a few of the others. On this button pad for the Casio, we see there's like a column here kind of joining up a few buttons, goes in a little bit here, skips those two. And we see, for example, there's a row here joining a bunch of the number buttons together. Uh, and we can see, for example, with the column, it comes down, comes down, and there's a via. And if we flip over, it looks like that veer goes to these traces that then go into the chip. The problem is the columns and rows, they're not actually neatly laid out in columns and rows. It's all kind of a mess. I could trace it out, but it looks a little bit time consuming. So I'm going to check out the other calculator now from J Burroughs. Okay, four screws. 
Looks like it's gonna be another snapping wonder. Wonderful, uh, I already like this better. It's got some foam pads in there for isolation, you know, quality, better quality and feel. Love that, J Burrows. Actually really similar, exactly the same part holding the battery on in the J Burrows calculator. Uh, we know now about the rivets, so we will preemptively cut those off. Although here they feel less, nah, they're still pretty intense. All right, so if you're disassembling a modern calculator, look out for your plastic rivets. Otherwise, those are gonna ruin your day. So why maybe you don't start with the most expensive calculator when you're first getting into this business. Yeah, that's, that's coming out much easier. Real similar architecture though. Again, same with the switches. It actually, funnily enough, it looks like it could have been made in the same factory. Even the switch sliders look like almost the same parts as the Casio and like they were done by a similar designer. Same with the button pads. Uh, so that's looking really good. Um, one just looks bigger, roomier, and it looks a lot easier to trace out where all the button pads go. So I think I might be using this one. And look at that PCB, it's just so much simpler. So I think this is going to be the basis for our project. Time for me to figure out where the buttons all go. So I just spent a good half hour to an hour going through, tracing out all the buttons, mapping out which ones are connected to which ones. I'm gonna put all this into a spreadsheet now to try and figure out the rows and columns. And then I can use the matrix keypad library in Arduino to read all the buttons quite easily. Thankfully, they're also easy to access on the board as each column and row has these lovely little silver pads and I've labeled some of them there. So it shouldn't actually be too hard to hook all these up. Here we have the finished product. It is a calculator that is musical. Now, as you saw, I basically soldered the IO pins of this ESP32 to the matrix pads for these lovely buttons. They've got a pretty nice feel for a rubber dome calculator setup. And we have six volts of AA power running to the ESP32, which steps it down to five, which steps it down to 3.3 and runs the whole show. That's pretty much the whole project. There is no sound synthesizer built into this. There's no speech synth. We are literally just using this as a MIDI controller. So I can go ahead, turn that on. I have it so the switch pushes in so that when you're playing this live, nothing you do is gonna switch it off unless you're like lifting up. That's an important performance feature. And then I have the sort of, similar to the dots on a guitar, I have the notes I like marked out. Uh, the notes, I believe that's of the major scale and yeah, it's basically as simple as that. All this is doing is the ESP32 microcontroller is reading the button pads and sending MIDI notes to Ableton over Wi-Fi using a MIDI Wi-Fi library. I did try MIDI Bluetooth. It was bad, it didn't work, it didn't pair. I just abandoned it, I went to MIDI Wi-Fi and it's pretty good. There's a little bit of intermittent lag here and there. Certainly not something you wanna rely on in a radio congested environment but it is pretty good. The lag I mentioned with the Wi-Fi MIDI does make my solo sound a little bad. I should probably practice more with it, but I have played it live. People do love the spectacle of it, and I certainly enjoy it. I do want to do some upgrades to this, make it cooler. Originally, I wanted to read these switches, but that looks like a real pain in the ass. It would be cool to be able to switch between like drum and melodic mode, but that's all future work. In any case, I'll give you a quick demo of how I use this now and I'll chuck in a little live video of me playing it at the end. So I just programmed the ESP32 in Arduino. It was really simple. And when I first did it, I basically didn't have rate limiting involved in any way, shape or form. I basically just had it, if I press this button, send this MIDI note, and the ESP32 would loop around millions of times a second and just keep blasting out MIDI notes. And so hooked up to certain synths in Ableton, you gave this really crunchy sound because you're re-triggering the note about a thousand times a second or, or you know, a hundred times a second, something like that. It was just wild. I've since stepped that down, <laughs> put basically a rate limit. So it's like there's note on, note off kind of stuff. 
it's a lot simpler and you can play it more like a regular keyboard. A combination of the Wi-Fi mini lag and the responsiveness of these buttons means that it's not excellent, but it's pretty good. It's pretty good. And the whole thing is this is meant to be fun for soloing. It's not really meant, you know, I'm not going to Royal Albert Hall to play the calculator. That's not until uh, I think July next year anyway. We can see we've got this thing switched on. Now we just need to get the laptop to pair to its Wi-Fi network. This runs a Wi-Fi AP that the laptop can connect to. We then use this app called RTP MIDI, which basically accepts the packets coming in from this ESP32 and turns them into a MIDI device within Windows, which we can then play with in Ableton. I've set the default IP address and port for the library we're using, hit OK, hit connect, and that'll jump straight on there. And you can see there's a nice low latency. I'm not exactly sure what the second half of that means, but it's not too bad. So if we then come over to Ableton, we should be able to configure this to receive the MIDI signals. And we can see there channel one, this is now indicating it's getting MIDI data. So if we go ahead and put a sweet synth, You can see there's a little bit of lag from when I hit the button to when it comes out of the laptop. That's difficult. It makes it really hard to solo fast. Like I can press the buttons really quickly and it will send the notes really quickly. But it just that little bit of lag between pressing and hearing does throw you off and that makes it difficult in a live environment. I'm tempted to make a wired version of this as impractical as it would be. It would just make it that much more of a performance instrument. As much as I hate the lag though, I do love the freedom that it being perfectly wireless gives me. My favorite, favorite thing about that is it means I can literally jump off stage, run around the whole venue. Do, 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 do. Yeah, I can just do nuts stuff. And I have done that before. Now I know I talked about the lag being an issue with Wi-Fi MIDI. I was actually kind of wrong about that. The reason it was bad in this case was because I was using the DirectX audio output in Ableton with over 4,000 samples of output buffer, which created about 100 milliseconds lag. If I switch to a nicer audio driver, uh, using this with my Steinberg USB audio module, I can get that down to 25 milliseconds and not have any sound issues. So if you listen to this, this is far better. It's it's not perfect, but it's it's playable. It's absolutely playable, absolutely soloable. And that is why I always take my Steinberg USB audio interface with me when I play live, because I can't be having a hundred milliseconds of audio delay because it just makes this thing unplayable. Fun, 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 fun. And the cool thing is because this is a MIDI controller, you can set it to play whatever instrument you want. So I got it set up with a nice fat bass. so good. I just want to keep making this better. I know this is nothing special. I know this is just a MIDI controller that happens to be built into a calculator, but this is a very unique piece of my musical performance because I started out with those Chinese musical calculators. I got to this. I love this thing. It looks cool. I just got to make it look even better in the second revision do some other cool stuff with it. And I cannot wait to do that. All that's left to do is say, it's been great showing you this. And here's a little bit of footage of me being silly with it on stage. Till next time, TK out. Go! Oh.